our gracious Father, as there is that call, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. We come to thee, we praise thy great name. O Lord, we thank thee for the breath that thou hast given to us physically. And O Lord, we thank thee most of all for that breath that we have spiritually. We thank thee for the day when we were born again, that new life was given to us. We thank thee for that day when we cried on to the Lord for mercy, that it was not of our own making, but the evidence of the work of God in us. And, O oh Lord, we thank thee for all of thy goodness to us in saving us, in keeping us, in leading us, and from the depths of our being then this evening, we desire to say, praise our great God. O oh Lord, we look to thee that in our time this evening, that we will rejoice again in the beauty of the gospel. We pray that we will be thrilled as we see again the Lord's mercy that has been extended to us. And O oh Lord, we pray that every believer in the meeting will be built up in the things of the Lord, that we might be led on with thyself. And for any that know thee not, O oh Lord, we cry to thee that a work of grace will be done in them. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that in these dark days in which we live, that we might be used as a testimony unto thy great name. O oh Lord, in this nation where our Lord's name is so despised, where the beautiful name of our Lord Jesus is taken as a curse word, O oh Lord, we cry to thee that we will be given mouths to speak for thee. And, O oh Lord, that it might even be our delight to point precious souls unto our great Saviour. The work in this neighbourhood, we pray, and through this city, we pray to thee that you will use every faithful witness to the furtherance of thy kingdom. O oh Lord, we pray that thou will deal with the falsehood that is on every hand. O oh Lord, we lament over those that are blinded in false religion as well as materialism. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that we will see a mighty move of God. That we pray, revive us again. And O oh Lord, come and move in this nation. We do pray. O oh Lord, we ask of thee that you will work in every one of our homes. O oh Lord, thou knowest those burdens of heart that press upon us, thou knowest every uncertainty, and thou knowest our concern for those that are far away from thee. And so, Lord, we cry to thee that in this year that we will know the Lord working in the families of our congregation. And, O oh Lord, we pray that we will know times of refreshing from our Lord's hand. So we commend this time to thee this evening. And forgive us of our sins, we pray. Humble us in thy sight, we ask. In our Lord's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please, to the hymn number 70. The hymn number 70 on the page 203. These are beautiful words. Immortal honors rest on Jesus' head. My God, my portion, and my living bread. The hymn number 70. And we will stand as we sing these words, please.
in verse 4 there, may it be the prayer of our hearts, oh that my soul could love and praise him more, and his beauty streets, his majesty and glory. We're going to turn for our scripture, please, to the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, and the chapter 11. Ezekiel and the chapter 11 and we'll read the entire chapter please together. Ezekiel 11. Moreover the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house which looked eastward and behold at the door of the gate five and twenty men among whom I saw Jaazaniah the son of Azur and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief or iniquity, and give wicked counsel in this city, which say, It is not near, let us build houses. This city is the cauldron, and we be the flesh. Therefore I prophesy against them, prophesy the Son of man, and the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, Thus have ye said to the house of Israel, For I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Ye have multiplied your slain in this city, and ye have filled the streets thereof with the slain. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Your slain, whom ye have led in the midst of it, they are the flesh. Uh, this city is the cauldron. And I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. You feared the sword, you feared the sword, and I will bring a sword upon you, said the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst thereof, and deliver you into the hands of strangers, and will execute judgments among you. You shall fall by the sword, and I will judge you in the border of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall he be the flesh in the midst thereof, but I will judge you in the border of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, for ye have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. It came to pass when I prophesied that Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died then fell I down upon my face, and cried with a loud voice, and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred, and all the house of Israel holy, are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get you far from the Lord, Unto us is this land given in possession. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the people, and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. They shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart, and will put a new spirit within you, and will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep mine ordinances, and do them. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for them, whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. Then did the cherubims lift up their wings, the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. Afterwards the Spirit took me up, 
brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spake unto them of the captivity of all the things that the Lord had showed me. I went there knowing that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of this precious truth. We have now the Catechism and the last couple of questions and answers have been dealing with the moral law. Uh, the moral law in its use for all men, then the unregenerate, and then next time the regenerate. And so the question this evening dealing with the unregenerate. I will read the question and we'll all give the answer together. What particular use is there of the moral law to unregenerate men? The moral law is of use to unregenerate men to awaken their consciences, to flee from wrath to come, and to drive them to Christ, or upon their continuance in the estate and way of sin, to leave them inexcusable and under the curse thereof. And when we speak here of the unregenerate, we're speaking of those that have not been born again, they have not been regenerated, and so they are the unregenerate and the moral law is of great value to them. It is to awaken their consciences to flee from the wrath to come. And so the value of the moral law to them is not, I must try harder to obey it, to earn my way to God, but rather the moral law is preaching to them that you have broken the law and the wrath of God is coming upon you because you have broken the law. Therefore, you need to flee from that wrath that is to come. It drives the sinner to Christ, the one who has kept the moral law of God perfectly. And so the moral law then is to awaken the unconverted that they might flee from the wrath and run to Jesus Christ. And it goes on then to say, upon their continuance in the state of way way of sin, to leave them inexcusable and under the curse thereof. And so since the moral law is reflected in our being, man is left without excuse. And so Paul speaks of this in the early chapters of the book of Romans, that the law of God is written upon the heart of man. Now because man is a fallen creature, Man does not have that perfect testimony in his being to himself, and yet there is sufficient to show him that he is a sinner. There is sufficient to condemn him. There is sufficient to leave him without excuse. And man, recognizing that his very being shows that he is a sinner, is to drive him then to the true revelation of God's word, the pure revelation rather of the moral law in the word of God. And so as man is pricked in his conscience, he is then to turn to the word of God, where of course he will be pricked even more. But therein then he will see that there is a way of escape in our blessed Lord. Praise God that we have one who has kept the law for us and one who we run to for mercy. May the Lord bless these thoughts to our hearts. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please, as the offering is received, and we're turning to the hymn 196. 196, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom. 196, we'll remain seated. At uh, the beginning of this hymn, please, as we worship the Lord in our tithes and offers. So remain seated at the hymn 196.
turn to God's Word again, please, to Ezekiel and the chapter 11. Ezekiel chapter 11, and I want to take as my text this evening the words of verse 16. Verse 16, therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I will be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. I shall be to them as a sanctuary. We will seek the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. We need the Lord's help as we come to meditate upon his word. Let's each ask the Lord for that need help, please. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for the greatness of the Lord's grace. O Lord, how plenteous is thy grace when there is grace to cover all thy sin. O Lord, what a gospel. We pray that our hearts will delight in it afresh this evening. Lord, that we will glory again in the cross. Grant help, we pray, in the ministry of your word and the hearing of it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 1662 was a year of great weeping and suffering among the Puritans in England. The following Charles II Act of Uniformity, the 2000 Puritan ministers were expelled from their pulpits. Some of those men suffered terribly. Joseph Elaine was one of those men. He was famous for his book, The Alarm to the Unconverted. After his ejection, he continued to preach, but he was imprisoned for it. His wife recorded how he defaced scorns and scoffs from magistrates, along with threats of hanging. After his release, he continued to preach, but again was imprisoned. He died only six years after the ejection, only 30 years old, 34 years old. Another time of great suffering in church history was for churches in Scotland in 1834. And that is often referred to as the disruption. The 450 evangelical ministers walked out of their congregations, uh, bringing their congregations up and with them, they were breaking away from the Church of Scotland uh, to form the Free Church of Scotland. They were convinced of the right of the church to be free from the interference of the state. They were convinced of the right of the church to make its own decisions. The congregations to choose their own ministers not for ministers to be imposed upon them by local aristocracy. And Thomas Brown describes in detail the great suffering of ministers as they would leave their manses, some living in very damp conditions, the congregations meeting outdoors in the Scottish winter. It was a time of great suffering. The congregation struggled to purchase land and materials to build churches and often great obstacles were placed in their way. Now how could Christians in times like that find comfort? The language of this chapter is that to them the Lord was a sanctuary. They lost a building, they lost homes. But to them, the Lord was a sanctuary. As Virgin said, banished from the public means of grace, we are not removed from the grace of the means. Isn't that beautiful? Banished from the means of grace, we are not removed from the grace of the means. Now this was a very encouraging message then for Ezekiel. Much of the book of Ezekiel thus far we have seen judgment and justice and actually that theme continues here in chapter 11 
And yet in the midst of it, there's a message of great hope for a remnant people. The Lord will be a sanctuary to his own. And this chapter 11, it marks the last part of Ezekiel's journey in the visionary to Jerusalem in this particular section. And so chapters 8 to 11, Ezekiel was in the visionary back in Jerusalem. And then chapter 11, verse 25, he is ministering then again to the captives. He is sharing with them the things that he has seen in the, in the visionary in these chapters 8 to 11. So if you remember back, Ezekiel had been in a meeting with the elders of Judah. And suddenly the Lord took him by the locks of the hair as where he was carried away. But how interesting the discussion must have been as Ezekiel then began to open his mouth and share with them what the Lord had indeed been showing him. Now last time we saw that in chapter 10 the glory of the Lord was leaving the temple in Jerusalem. And that continues in this chapter where in chapter 11, 25 and onwards we see the glory of the Lord shifting now and has shifted right away from the temple. The glory of the Lord has forsaken the temple building in Jerusalem. All that was left then we could say was a physical sanctuary. Those in Jerusalem had a building but it was just a shell in reality because the blessing of the Lord in that building was gone. And in great contrast the Lord says to Ezekiel that among the captives at the Kabar River in Babylon there will be a people who find the Lord to be their sanctuary. The people back in Jerusalem, they're hung up in this matter. We still have a building. But by the Kabar River, there are those that were saying, we have the Lord. We have the Lord. Now in the Word of God, there are different ways in which this word sanctuary is used. A heaven is the Lord's sanctuary. The promised land was said to be the Lord's sanctuary. The tabernacle, the temple, the Lord's sanctuary, and very especially the holiest of all was the Lord's sanctuary. And the Lord's people are also a sanctuary, a holy temple. But here we find the Lord is the sanctuary. The Lord is the sanctuary for his people, a house. For us. Uh, this is what we want to look at then this evening, uh, looking at some of the other parts of the chapter together. The Lord is a sanctuary for his remnant saints. So I want to see first of all, the Lord will never see mourning saints without comfort. The Lord will never see mourning saints without comfort. But remember back in chapter 9, we had that mention of mourning. And Ezekiel shows himself then to be a man who is truly mourning. A man who is truly in grief over sin and more than that, what sin has done. Now early in this chapter, Ezekiel sees 25 men. And so in verse 1, moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me onto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looked eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men. And two of them are named Jehazaniah and Pelotiah. And perhaps Ezekiel recognized these two. Well, certainly, the two of the men, we are given their names. And they're described as princes of the people. Now, princes of the people, we would long that such men would be God fearing men that would be setting an example to the nation. But what do we find in verse 2? Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief or iniquity and give wicked counsel in this city. 
And then in verse 3 we are told their words, which say, It is not near. Let us build houses. This city is in the cauldron. Can we be the flesh? Now, many explanations have been given of this verse 3. Every commentator that I read given a different explanation as to what that they mean. But we are up to understand verse 3 as words of taunt. Now, like any figure of speech and saying, and evidently this was something that people understood in Jerusalem, but like any figure of speech, it meant something that the people then could understand that maybe today we struggle to understand. It's an idiom. And so if you look with me at verse 15, I think this makes it clear that it is a taunt. Son of man, thy brethren, even thy brethren, the men of thy kindred and all the house of Israel, holy, are they unto whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said. And so in these words, the Lord is saying to Ezekiel, this is what the people back in Jerusalem have said. Get you far from the Lord. And so the people in Jerusalem are saying concerning the captives in Babylon, get you away. Unto us is this land given in possession. And we might have expected that the people in Jerusalem would have a heart for those of their kindred that were taken away into exile. But instead, those in Jerusalem were saying, this is the Lord's land, and of course the Lord had given Canaan, the Lord had given Jerusalem. But they were saying, we have Jerusalem, you're far away. Therefore, the blessing is with us. We are his heritage. But what had Ezekiel been seeing? Ezekiel had been seeing the glory departing and now departing. Ezekiel had been seeing the Lord then abandon, as it were, Jerusalem for that time. And the Lord says, While I've abandoned Jerusalem and the temple, my blessing is with the exiles, or company among the exiles in Babylon. And among the company in Babylon, you will be those that have the Lord to be a sanctuary. And here then is the comfort. Here are mourning saints, and those in Babylon, they were not only mourning over their position, but they were mourning over Jerusalem. But the Lord says, I will be to you a sanctuary. Now coming back to verse 3, this image of the cauldron. This city is in the cauldron. We be the flesh. Some believe that what's in view here is that meat belongs in a pot. And so to say we're in the pot is saying we belong here. So if the pot is Jerusalem and we're in the pot, then this is where we are. This is where we belong, nothing's going to happen to us. I think the best explanation, and it's expounded by Fairburn and Greenhill, is that the words of verse 3 are actually a taunting. Well, certainly the latter part, this city is in the cauldron, and we be in the flesh. We be the flesh. Because if you turn to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 1, and it's interesting words in Jeremiah chapter 1, and these two men that have mentioned suggest that these princes were mocking the word of God. Jeremiah 1 and the verse 13. The word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot. I see a cauldron. And the face thereof is toward the north. And the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. And so this cauldron, this seething pot that was looking toward the north, the figure there is speaking of how from the north would come a Hadavarian army, that Jerusalem would be destroyed from the north. And so the suggestion is then that in Ezekiel 11, these princes are saying the exiles have been carried away. And so there was a coming from the north. 
The exiles have been carried away, but we that are left behind are quite fine. But worse, the fire under the cauldron. Where is this prophecy of Jeremiah now? We're the flesh in the pot, but where is the fire? They were mocking the words of the prophet and therefore the words of Almighty God. But what was Ezekiel doing in Kedar? He was in grief. He was mourning. The Lord came then in comfort. I will be a sanctuary to thee. And verse 3 where it says, which say, it is not near, let us build houses. These words have been variously understood and uh, words change around their order in various versions of the scriptures. Some believe it's in terms of time. It's not near the time, so let us build houses. Or the enemy is not near, so let us build houses. Certainly, it's bringing out this idea that we are quite comfortable as we are. There's no need for us to panic. And yet, the reality is something very different. Now, before we move on, I haven't mentioned this word little. I will be to them as a little sanctuary. Again, these words have been translated in different ways. What we have in the authorised version is a very literal translation. I will be to them as a little sanctuary. And some believe that what is being said here is that there was a big sanctuary in Jerusalem, but in your destitution, I'll be to a very different type of sanctuary. Some believe that what's in view here is nothing to do with size of building, but rather of time. I will be to you for a little time, a sanctuary. That is, during the seven years of captivity, I will be to you as a sanctuary, but then I'll bring you back to Jerusalem again. Of course, that is what would happen. Others believe that this little is actually referring to the remnant itself. I will be to them as a little sanctuary. I will be to this little company. As we'll see in chapter 12, not all of these exiles, in fact, very few of them at this time, would find the Lord to be a sanctuary. And we might have expected that when they were carried away into exile that their hearts would have been humbled, and yet not so. So the Lord is a little remnant. A few will see the Lord as a sanctuary. And yet what comfort there is then in this passage. And what comfort for this congregation. Whatever troubles may come our way. What a blessing to know the Lord is a sanctuary. Would you rather be on the persecuting side of the 25 back in Jerusalem? Or would you rather be one of those that was comforted? One of those that was persecuted? Would you rather be one of those that was comforted with the Savior? And surely we all choose to be those that are comforted. Be away from the place of the spoiler. And what comfort then? The Lord will never see more than saints without comfort. I want to see, secondly, that the Lord will fulfill his covenant. The Lord will fulfill his covenant. And the Lord says here, I will be a sanctuary. And he is the sanctuary because he is the God of covenant. And the language of covenant permeates this particular chapter. You see, the men in Jerusalem, they were really saying, Jerusalem has been given by covenant. And therefore, since we are in Jerusalem, we are in the pot, all is well then for us. Now, Jerusalem certainly was given by covenant, and yet 
And what had happened was that the people had focused more on a building than God's covenant promises being to a people. So that's not to say that the building had not performed an important function it had, but the covenant was with a people. So I mentioned how Ezekiel saw 25 men and he identifies two of them. They talk about the pot. And God answers them. In verse 7, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Your slain, whom ye have led in the midst of it, they are the flesh. And this city is the cauldron. And so the Lord is saying, in one way you're right. Jerusalem is the pot. And through your lying words, people in this city will be destroyed. Those that have heeded the word of the false teacher, those that have failed to cry unto the Lord for mercy, they are the slain in the pot. But notice at the end of verse 7, but I will bring you forth out of the midst of it. The Lord would deal with the princes differently than the people. Now we'll see more of this as we come to chapter 12, but if you look with me then at verse 11, this city shall not be your call. So it would be for many of the population, but not for the princes. This city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst of it. But I will judge you in the border of Israel. Second Kings chapter 25, read of how Zedekiah was taken out of Jerusalem, the king that is, and as he was brought to in, in the direction of Jerusalem, I'm sorry, the brought in the direction of Babylon. They stopped in their journey. 2 Kings 25, 7, they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah. And some believe that there were other leaders as well as those two princes that were destroyed at that time. And so if you look at me in verse 13, it came to pass when I prophesied the Pelatiah, remember he was one of those that Ezekiel had seen, that Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Then fell I down upon thy face, and cried with a loud voice, and said, Our Lord God, wilt thou make a full end of the remnant of Israel? Now, as Ezekiel makes this cry, now are you going to make a full end? Ezekiel is really crying out to the Lord, are you going to break your covenant? Are all of your people going to be destroyed? Remember that time when Moses had come down from the mountain, there was the golden calf. In Exodus 32, verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, I will make of you a nation. I'll destroy Israel. I'll make a new nation altogether from you. What did Moses say? Exodus 32, 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants to whom thou swearest by thy own self. Remember your covenant. And Ezekiel then really is saying the same thing. Lord, you made a covenant. You said you would preserve a people. And the Lord explains to Ezekiel, I have remembered my covenant. And that is why mercy will be shown to some among the exiles. Jerusalem will be destroyed. But from the exiles there will be a rebuilding. And so yeah, this brings us then to verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off, among the heathen. And lo, I have scattered them among the countries, yet I will be to them as a little such. The Lord is saying, when I used the Babylonians to bring discipline, I was doing it for the good of this people. So then, if you look at verse 19, we have words here, if you know the book of Ezekiel, they come up later in chapter 36, we have also similar language in the book of Jeremiah 33 and then quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 as being fulfilled in the new covenant. Ezekiel 11:19. I will give them one heart 
and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them an heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes. And you see those in Jerusalem, they were walking in their detestable way, verse 21. But how did the Lord's work in the hearts of these exiles? They will walk in the Lord's statutes. They will keep his ordinances and do them. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Uh, so if you look with me over in the book of Hebrews, I'll show you here you know, that these words are revealing to us that God's covenant dealings is the dealing of the gospel. That what was being preached to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 11 is indeed the gospel of grace. Hebrews chapter 8, in the verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people mutual will I will dwell in them they will dwell in me and so here the Lord is saying to Ezekiel among that company the Holy Spirit will come and do a work of grace and heart the hard, stony heart will be taken away. A new heart will be given. That stubborn walk that characterized them in days past will be transformed. They will now walk in the Lord's statutes. The Lord says, I will fulfill my covenant. Every time the Lord saves a soul today, he is revealing that he is the God that keeps the covenant. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me my people. The Lord is faithful to his own word. Uh, do you think of how this company in, in Babylon they lost everything? So much had been taken from them. But the enemy could not touch The world can do all it can to attack the church of Jesus Christ, but it can never undo the covenant promises of God. When God says he will save, he will. When God says he will renew the heart, he will. And so there was to be this people according to covenant that would find the Lord then to be their sanctuary. And that brings us then to the third point. The Lord will bring the reality of grace. The Lord will bring the reality of grace. You see, the 25 men back in Jerusalem, they were comforting themselves. We have a building. But Ezekiel and his captives, those that experienced this new heart, they were able to comfort themselves very differently. We have God as our sanctuary. We have the reality of what the building in Jerusalem typified. And isn't this chapter saying then, while it was a wonderful thing to have that building at that time, it's much more important to have the reality of what the building spoke of. Now the two men that Ezekiel tells about, Jehazaniah and Pelatiah, they had great names, but tragically, they didn't know the truth, the reality of what their names spoke of. Jehazaniah means the Lord hears or heard of the Lord. The Lord would close his ears to these princes. Their day of opportunity was gone. The Lord's ears were open to the cry of these exiles in Babylon. Elotiah, some say that, that means God delivers. Some say it means distinguished by the Lord. He was destroyed. 
not distinguished in a positive way, but the, rem the remnant would have the reality. The Lord delivers. The Lord sets apart in accordance with his rules. And isn't it true that much of religion today, it's just like that temple in Jerusalem. It's just an empty shell. And sometimes the more noise, the more show, the more devoid it is of reality. And this chapter is preaching to us then we need to have reality. Better to have the reality than to be able to boast that you have an empty shell. Remember, the whole point of the book of Ezekiel is Ezekiel was a priest. He had come to the age of 30. Ordinarily, the time that he would enter into service in Jerusalem, and the Lord is saying to him, Ezekiel, you're grieving that you're not entering into the service in the Lord's house. Here you have this wonderful reality. You have found the Lord to be your sanctuary. And what was the sanctuary? Now, this is a sermon in itself, but I'll just mention these briefly. The sanctuary was a place of holiness. Now, the Lord said, I will be your holiness. I will be your righteousness. Now, the, the sanctuary was a place of sanctification. Being set apart. Cleansing, growth. The Lord says, I will be your sanctification, Ezekiel. The sanctuary is a place of mercy. Remember the holiest of all, as it was called, the, the sanctuary. That was the place where the high priest would bring the blood, sprinkle it on the mercy seat. It was the place where sin was seen to be propitiated, covered, sinners accepted. I will be your means of acceptance. And those back in Jerusalem in coming days, they will lament the destruction of Jerusalem. Now how can there be acceptance before God without a literal physical altar? And Ezekiel. I will be your atoning sacrifice. And the sanctuary is seen as a place of refuge. Remember Adonijah ran and caught hold of the horns of the altar. Now in his case he was ill-using the horns of the altar. But the penitent runs to the Lord as our sanctuary. A place of refuge. The sanctuary was a place of communion. Second Corinthians six sixteen. What agreement have the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Sweet communion. What a blessing for the Lord's people to be able to say, The Lord is my sanctuary. I know sweet communion with him. And the sanctuary surely was a place of stillness. To be still to know that I am God. And for the priest, the sanctuary was a place of service. To serve our God. Coming back to my opening remarks about rejection, I was thinking yesterday of the blind man in John 9. Remember how he was cast out of the temple? It was considered that he had spoken in defense of our Lord Jesus, that he had sided with Jesus. He was cast out of the temple, he was excommunicated. Jesus went to him, John 9 35. Dost thou believe in the Son of God? And while his physical eyes had been opened, he still did not truly really grasp the gospel of Jesus Christ. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. And then we read these beautiful words. 
he worshipped him. Now remember the context is he had been cast out. And he was told, you're no longer welcome at the place of worship. Don't come here. And the Lord says, I am he. The man worships the Lord. He found Christ to be his sanctuary. He had the reality. And for those that cast that man out, the building only was a shed. They did not know the reality of what the temple spoke of. Christ was the reality. Praise God then today, we can run afresh to our Lord. The Lord says, I will be your sanctuary. And I will be your God. And you will be my people. And we rejoice that we can run the sanctuary. Lord bless his word. We will close, please, with the words of him 569. 569. I'm saved to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows. Hiding. 569 will stand as we sing these words.
gracious Father, we thank Thee for the mercy of God in the Gospel of Christ. We rejoice for one who is our haven, for one who is our place of safety, for one who is our sanctuary. We run afresh to Thee tonight. We thank Thee for all of the blessing to be found in Thee. Take Thy word, we pray, and seal it to our hearts. We pray that it will indeed be a great comfort to each one of our souls and transforming in our walk in these days. Be with us through this week, we ask. May we be a bright testimony for thy name. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all.